So we're very fortunate to have Francesco Camille. Uh, we're fortunate to have him here in Trieste, fortunate to have him here for this talk. And he's going to talk about fundamental limits of shallow neural networks with not so small training sets. And I think also some Gaussian equivalents uh, yeah, is going to be a topic. So cool. Also, yeah. cool. Yes. Looking forward to it. Take it away. So thanks. Thanks for the great opportunity. I have the honor, uh, privilege, and responsibility to be the last one uh, in the week. Uh, and I'm very happy to, to be here, so it's, it's been a great week, I've learned plenty of stuff. Uh, thank also to the organizer, I would like to make an applause for the organizer. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's get to it. Uh, as <laughs> Sebastian was pointing out, I cheated a little bit because uh, I changed the title just with this round parenthesis, not so small data set. Uh, we will understand why. And this is a joint work with uh, Jean Barbier, which is around here, yes, and, and Daria Tieplova. Um, it is still not on archive, but it will be, uh, well, we submit it tonight, right? So, <laughs> yes, it will be in the next days, hopefully. <clears throat> okay, so just a quick outline of how the thing goes. So first, I will introduce uh, the problem. I will state it, uh, um, let's say, as precisely as possible. And then I will state the main theorem. This should take the first 20 minutes uh, of the talk. And then since it's Friday, uh, let's say after this, you could also turn your brain off more or less. Um, because after this, uh, I have uh, sort of comparisons with uh, many other scalings that are already present in the literature because it is, of course, is <coughs> a well-studied problem. Uh, not in the same scalings as we do exactly, but still, uh, a comparison was needed also to understand what's new about it. And uh, lastly, I will sketch the proof a little bit in the last uh, five or four slides, okay? All right, so let's start with it. So the problem we are studying is a two-layer neural network, of course, um, with an input dimension uh, that is D. So it's uh, this input layer here as D neurons. And uh, <clears throat> we have also a hidden layer, only one hidden layer of size P and a set of weights uh, that is multiplying this x here, um, which is of size p by d necessarily. We have an active activation function in the middle layer, uh, which we'll, we will assume to be regular uh, enough, we'll see, and it is from r to r, so you have to, to think of it as applied component-wise to this vector wx, which is uh, p-dimensional. And then finally, we have a projection onto a one-dimensional or low-dimensional, but here for simplicity it's one-dimensional space, uh, through this vector A, okay? And finally, we apply this uh, function F, this readout, uh, that can be also stochastic, and that's why I added this, uh, this capital A uh, as, a superscript, as a subscript, which can be a random variable. It's just introduced to model some stochasticity. We'll, we'll see an example later. <coughs> so. All right, the, the setting we're interested in is supervised learning. So we want to, we want to understand what happens when we train a, um, this two-layer neural network on a given data set that is a set of couples, x mu, that is d-dimensional, and uh, it is fed on, on the left of this, right of this network, uh, maybe your left. And, um, and we also, tell the network what's the right label it should produce. So we are trying to fit these couples x mu and, and, and y mu uh, by adjusting the weights a and w in such a way that these relationships here are, these relations here are uh, verified up to a certain error, let's say, a certain tolerance that we introduce. So the main goal here is to, okay, there are mm, several training procedures of which I'm not an expert, so I will fly quickly over that. Um, but the main goal is, in general, to produce the smallest uh, possible generalization error, which is the true trial for a, for a neural network, let's say. So when I generate a new couple from, uh, from a rule that I know, so x nu with the correct label y nu, what happens if I compare the correct label with the output that instead the, the trained neural network would yield, okay? So we compute this uh, quadratic deviation, and this is our measure of uh, generalization error. So it's, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, that's right. There should be an expectation, in, in fact. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're right. There will be later. I don't know why I didn't put it here, honestly. <laughs> okay. Um, so if it's not stochastic instead, it's something that makes sense. Okay, so what affects this uh, generalization error? <clears throat> well, many things. Uh, I tried to mention uh, the most relevant for us and or the most, most interesting. So the first one is, of course, the size of the training set. And we expect that the more points we have uh, for these couples, the, the, the more accurate the, the, the prediction will be. Then we have the size of the network itself, which, um, let's say, regulates the expressive power of the network. In this case, since we have only a two-layer neural network, this is parameterized by P, which is the size of the hidden layer. Um, the dimensionality of the input, which is D, this is another factor we should take into account because it, it quantifies how many real numbers we feed into the network each time. And also, it, it affects the number of weights that we have to tune. And uh, the method used to, to train the network, but Maybe uh, more imp most importantly, the nature of the data set, um, i.e., what is the true underlying function that the, the, the two this two-layer neural network is, uh, is trying to fit. Of course, there are many more, but um, the, the central question for, for us in, in, in our paper is uh, what is the least possible um, generalization error and when is it achieved? Not how, really, because we are not focusing on algorithmic questions or on uh, SGD or, or training procedures, but the situation, the setting in which, uh, in which this error is achieved. And we will see that this uh, highlighted, uh, um, well, our results, let's say, put in a very precise relationship this, um, this uh, highlighted quantity. So N, P, and D, which governs the number of data and the relative sizes of the layer in the network. And of course, the nature of the data set is important. So concerning the, the latter, the, the nature of the data set, we are interested in uh, maybe the, the most popular theoretical uh, framework we can work in, which is the teacher-student setup. Well, not, not the most popular, but one of the most popular. Um, so this amounts to say that the data set is not uh, generated by God only knows what function. It's, um, it's generated itself by a teacher uh, neural network with some weights, uh, A star and W star, that are fixed and drawn from some distribution that we assume to be Gaussian, and they are completely factorized. We will see that this is not completely uh, silly later, but for, for the moment, I hope you can accept this fact. And um, all right, so <clears throat> the couples are generated in this way. Once you uh, state a rule to generate this X mu here, then the Y mu is determined uh, by this relation, okay? so. Here we have the same stochasticity. In order to be a little bit more precise, I've added some uh, Gaussian noise that has uh, some regularizing properties here only for, uh, well, only for, for, let's say for technical reasons, but not only for that. Um, okay, so saying that Y is generating in this way is uh, equivalent to say that the Y is uh, drawn from this P out, okay? So, um, which is called some, sometimes output kernel. Uh, that depends on the uh, quantity here, um, on, on, on this uh, a, a star transpose phi, etc., which is the, one, the same one that enters the uh, stochastic function f uh, a mu. And um, you can realize this, specific, this uh, particular mapping, mapping between these two definitions using this p out here below. And, uh, and the two problems become equivalent. Of course, the first one is let's say, more easily interpretable because you can read directly the two-layer neural network. The second one is uh, uh, easier to treat, let's say, uh, analytically and, and, and rigorously. So the main theoretical restriction that, that um, let's say, that we assume for our work is that the X mu's, which I still haven't specified, yes? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I haven't said that yet but I'm going to say it in the next slide. <laughs> okay. Um, I was saying, yeah, that the main theoretical restriction here is that um, the X mu is drawn from, uh, they are all IID for any mu, and, and their components are also IID. Here we can, you know, let's say, 
uh, build a more sophisticated model, uh, introducing a covariance between the, the components of the X mu or drawing it from a mixture of Gaussians, etc. This would be <coughs> another thing to be addressed in the future. Okay, that's uh, what, what Bruno was pointing at, I guess. Um, so before I, uh, I asked what is the best possible scenario for the student, well, the, this scenario is when the student matches exactly the architecture in every uh, sense of, uh, of the teacher, which means that he, they are using the same f, the same phi, and the, the stochasticity in the f is the same and it is known by the student, as well as, uh, let's say, the prior from, uh, on the weights. Um, so basically, a base optimal student, very informally to, to wrap it up, he is aware of anything but the, the true weights, of course, because otherwise is, uh, um, the problem is trivial. And as a consequence, um, the base optimal student has access to this base posterior, um, which is this one here. So I have collected the, in theta, in this bold theta, uh, the parameters of the network, so A and W. And I've put a Gaussian prior, so this capital D here stands for a factor, completely factorized Gaussian measure, okay? And uh, all right, so we have this normalizing probability. The usual, it is usually called evidence or um, partition function. We'll see it later. And what remains after here, so the product of, over this mu of the p outs, is up to a factor that, again, I cheated a little bit, I, uh, I raised is the probability of uh, the data set given a star, uh, given a, a star equal to A and W star equal to W. Okay, so this is the base posterior. And um, so how ideal is all of this? Because uh, maybe you're wondering if I'm trying to trick you in some way, a little bit, not uh, that much. Um, so why do we choose a base optimal student? The reason is that uh, he has the best, well, why do we place ourselves in this uh, base optimal setting? The fact is that um, we can compute in this setting, it's, it's very nice theoretically speaking, and we can compute what is the least possible uh, generalization error in, uh, in a way I shall outline later. And uh, this generalization error is uh, yielded by this predictor here, by the base optimal predictor, which is the a posteriori mean uh, of the y given the data set and the x new that has uh, just been fed uh, into the network. Okay, so this is not what is called, what is usually called a uh, one-shot estimator that you would get from the minimization of an empirical risk or with SGD, I guess. Uh, it's different. It's an average over many models that are weighted uh, in an optimal way, and that's why it's supposed to lead, well, it, it leads. It's, a, it's informal, but it can be made formal. Yes. No, it's me. Any algorithm uh, that that has at disposal the data set DN, and which is yes, yes. For this data, yes, it's true. Yes, but it's in the, any algorithm um, can at most hope for this generalization error. Cannot do better. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I was saying that, okay, so this is ideal, but um, still it has some theoretical relevance for these reasons. And uh, uh, I wanted also to remark that uh, the choice of IID Gaussian price is not so silly because it is coherent with the uh, L2 norm regulators in empirical risk minimization. Uh, I will outline also that later. So before uh, stating the theorem, I need to introduce these quantities. And um, uh, let's say, as annoying as these slides can be, uh, they are necessary for, for uh, almost every presentation I made. So uh, the first one is the posterior. You, you've already seen it. And uh, the second one is the partition function, which is the normalization of, uh, of the posterior measure. Then we have the free entropy. Uh, or minus free energy uh, up to a certain beta that here we have set to one for those of you that are more familiar with the statistical mechanics jargon. And then, more importantly, we have the mutual information. This is the true relevant information theoretical quantity that uh, is going to yield the base optimal limit for the generalization error. Um, all right, so as you can see, uh, 
the mutual information and the free entropy are in a very close relation. In particular, we just have this remainder here with respect to the free entropy that appears as a high dimensional quantity still because it has the A star and the W star, but if you use the central limit theorem and the law of large numbers, you can reduce it to low dimensional quantity pretty easily. <coughs> okay, so of course this um, model has a simple ancestor in, uh, in the literature, which is the GLM, that for our purposes we can imagine as a one layer neural network with no hidden layer. And um, in the, the teacher-student setup, this was studied by Jean and collaborators, and they were able to establish the uh, information theoretical limits for this problem. So <clears throat> we know we actually have uh, a formula for the mutual information that, that you read here on the bottom of the slide. Uh, we have a formula that is replica symmetric in spring glass jargon, which means that, uh, let's say, which means that the relevant order parameters uh, in this, um, in this uh, statistical mechanics problem are concentrating. They do not fluctuate anymore. And this yields a, a formula which is a variational formula, and you need to optimize over a finite number of parameters. So uh, this concentration yields uh, this kind of phenomenon in, in, in the final formula. So here I denote the, the quantities coming from the, from the GLM, which will produce in, in, this, in this student setup, um, student teacher setup, a different data set in principle. So even if I fed uh, the same X mu, I would get different Y mu's in principle, okay? Um, so I denote, to distinguish them from the two layer neural network quantities, I denote all these quantities by a small circle on top. And um, all right, so for this model, model I am, Again, assuming something very simple, like that the Vs here, that the teacher, net, uh, the teacher weights for this GLM, the teacher GLM weights, are IID Gaussians, and then I inserted also another noise here. Uh, I decided to put it there explicitly, but I could also reabsorb it into the P out with a convolution of a Gaussian. It's just a deformation. It can be reabsorbed as a, as a deformation. You can see it also from here if you want. It can be reabsorbed as a deformation of, of, uh, of the p-out. So also for this model, you can build the free entropy and the mutual information and compute the two, or one of the two, let's say. But once you have one, you also have the other, generally speaking. So is it uh, everything clear up to now? If there are any questions, this is a good moment. Okay, good. Um, all right. Ah, uh, yeah, I forgot this slide, of course. Um, so what is the relevant scaling regime for, for the GLM? Because this is a well-studied problem. Um, and uh, it is known that, let's say, we can observe phase transitions or if you want non-trivial generalization error, which are either non-zero or uh, not identically one uh, for any number of samples you have. The, the non-trivial regime is uh, when alpha, this ratio n over d, which is number of samples divided by dimension of the heat pool layer or their dimensionality, if you want, uh, has to be of order one. So in this case, you get a non-trivial generalization error with this, uh, this plot. Uh, by the way, I should have cited the paper. It's taken from, from, from Jean's uh, et al. Um, paper. And uh, it was for, this was for a Gauss-Bernoulli uh, teacher weights, if I w well remember, but for Gaussian, pure Gaussian weights, it should be the same. You see that um, as soon as alpha increases, which means that I get more and more samples with respect to the dimension of the input, the generalization error gets better and better, okay? And it goes to zero and alpha goes to infinity. All right, so main, main result number one, what time is it? Yes, 20 minutes, okay. Main result number one, uh, okay, recall these definitions. So we have the model, uh, we have the teacher. This is basically the teacher generating these labels for the x uh, the two-layer uh, neural network teacher, and on the right, left, um, no, your right, sorry. <laughs> on your right, you have the, um, the labels that instead a, a GLM teacher would generate, okay? And so they have also two different data sets, okay? There will, there will be D and D0, if you want. Okay, so our theorem that uh, we proved in collaboration with, uh, with Jean and Dasha um, states that if we tune uh, rho and epsilon appropriately, which means rho equals the expectation of this phi prime, 
so of the, the first derivative of the activation function, the hidden layer. And epsilon is this combination of the two, okay. And uh, uh, phi is odd and regular enough, and, and same for f, pa almost surely. Then we can control the difference between the free entropy of uh, the two-layer neural network associated to the learning problem in two-layer neural network and the learning problem in the JLM. We can control the difference with this order, okay? That is ugly. I mean, it's not uh, the, the most, the best looking uh, remainder you've ever seen, of course. But it presents uh, some interesting features already, okay? I, I'm gonna get to the next slide. Don't be scared because this will appear in every slide from this moment on. All right, so this property, this control, uh, is inherited by the uh, mutual information related to the, to the two problems because they have, uh, if you well remember, yeah, they deferred, uh, the, the free entropy deferred from the mutual information just for one term and uh, in both cases, and, and both term um, concentrated, uh, well, converged around the, same, around the same thing with the speed that we can control. And this does not affect uh, the control that we have on the mutual information. So um, you see that this order keeps appearing again and again. So maybe it, uh, it is appropriate and with it to identify this scaling, this uh, tilde lim, the, this tilde limit, uh, in which we, uh, yeah, it is true that we, uh, we let n, p, and d go to infinity, um, but in order for the two mutual informations or free entropies to match, we need to do it very carefully and the, the sequences we choose satisfy this limit here. So um, you see that N, sorry, you see from, from this scaling that N over D um, equal to order one, which means an interesting regime for the GLM is still allowed thanks to this N over D to the three halves, okay? But uh, we need, we have this other red guy here, we need it to go to zero, so which means that we are, we are forced, if we want to collapse the two models, to, to make the two models collapse, we are forced to take P uh, significantly larger than, uh, than the number of samples. So the hidden layer here, uh, apparently the, the size of the hidden layer plays a crucial role in the, in the identifica identification of these two models. It has to be very large, compared to the number of samples that, that the network has at disposal to learn. Okay, so as a consequence, again, in the same scaling regime, uh, yes. P, number of hidden units, yes. If P, uh, not really. Uh, yeah, I have an extra layer in the middle, yes. Yeah. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it comes from the analysis. It cannot be fundamental. I agree with you. Uh, yes. So, have I replied to you? Okay. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, uh, you mean Gaussian equivalence principles? I mean, there is something Gaussian uh, going on. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, uh, it's the phenomenon with, that is going on. It is slightly different though. I'm gonna compare to, to that one later. Okay. All right. Um, so, yes, N over D is still allowed, as I said. Ah, Marco, by the way, the reason why only this N by P appears, it might be because we were interested in P going to infinity, and so we discarded some subleading orders that uh, might be go ar going around, okay? I will check that later. Uh, that this or in this order here, uh, we kept only those things that we, let's say, since we, we aimed at sending NP and D to infinity, 
I kept only those orders that uh, I thought it would be uh, would have been challenging for this limit. Uh, no, it's not the case. Uh, I think I think there's something similar going on uh, in in the mean field regimes, which is what I was telling you yesterday. <clears throat> okay. All right. So yeah, as I was telling you, um, this property is uh, carrying on to the um, to the uh, generalization error, which is then the same in this in this very same scaling. It's the same um, for the GLM which we know, we have a formula to compute that, and the two-layer neural network. So we could get a closed formula for that, <coughs> which I have not displayed here because uh, otherwise it becomes more cumbersome. Okay, so just a disclaimer on this equivalence on how it should be interpreted. So the first, uh, because it has uh, arisen many times in, in conversation with, uh, with colleagues, let's say, interactions with colleagues, so what we are stating is that if we train this two-layer neural network on the, this data set here that was generated on, uh, by a two-layer neural network, this yields a base optimal generalization error, which is uh, equal, okay, so numerically equal to the uh, base optimal generalization error that, would, uh, uh, that a GLM student would achieve if trained on the data set generated by a GLM teacher. It is, uh, we cannot state at this level that if I train the two-layer neural network on the data set gener generated by the GLM teacher, this reaches the base optimal performance, okay? So there's no crossing in this, uh, <coughs> in this diagram. Okay, so yeah, here I will just go quickly maybe, yes, because I wanna go to some, some of the proofs. Uh, yeah? Sorry, sorry, say it again. It's the same, yes, they, they are base optimal, so they match uh, every time, yeah. In some sense, they are going to infinity together, okay. Okay, so uh, why is it not so, not so silly to assume a, a completely factorized prior on the, on the teacher weights? Well, because basically, if you, intro, if you slightly modify your free entropy, introducing this uh, inverse absolute temperature beta, Okay, uh, in front of this Hamiltonian, that is this quantity here, where you see I have inserted some Gaussian weights, uh, well, tuned by, with variances tuned by lambda and sigma here, just to be, for the sake of generality, let's say. If you, uh, okay, this problem here can yield uh, an empirical risk minimization. In fact, uh, when I send beta to infinity, the Fn, sorry, the integral in Fn is dominated by uh, those weights configurations that minimize the, this Hamiltonian Hn, which has this log P out serving as a loss, let's say, and the other two uh, contributions are norm regulators, okay? So this is why I was insisting on, uh, on this fact. This is very informal, by the way, huh? uh, just to give you an idea. So about related works, uh, the first example that comes to my mind is the committee machine. Um, this committee machine, typically, even though uh, I have to say I'm, I'm rather new to this literature, so please correct me if, uh, if I make mistakes. Huh? Um, so, in this committee machine, typically you have a very wide input layer, okay, in which you feed your X mu's, uh, let's say D, as before. Then you have a narrow hidden layer and, and finally uh, a readout. This scaling is um, different from ours because uh, at least for the papers I've read, uh, like uh, Jean worked on it and then there are some other papers from the 90s by Sompolinsky um, et al. Um, only n and d go into infinity, which means number of samples, oops, sorry, number of samples and input dimensions, which is the size of the input layer here. And whereas P remains of order one, this is uh, strictly speaking not covered by, by our scaling here. Because if P stays finite, then you have, you have to make D become very large in order to, to hold again. So there is a complicated combination of stuff going on here. 
So it's not exactly the same. The thing, okay, the regime uh, which I think uh, our scaling has more in common with is this mean field regime that was uh, studied in, uh, in the seminal paper by uh, May, Montanari, and Guy in 2018, um, which occurs when um, the size of the hidden layer is uh, remarkably larger than the size of the, of the input layer. So when, in our language, when P is much, much greater than D, Okay, and uh, in the analysis they carry out, uh, it's, let's say, it does, not take, it does not need to take into account of the number of samples because they, uh, they strictly speaking, they study uh, an SGD dynamics on this, uh, on this two-layer neural network. And what they find is that, um, is that you can track the empirical distribution of, of the weights of this network using a distributional equation and following a gradient flow. And... Um, it seems that uh, in both in this uh, mean field regime they studied and in our uh, model, the fact that P goes large has some intrinsic uh, regularizing properties that we need to take into account uh, for Gaussianity, uh, asymptotic Gaussianity reasons. <coughs> then there are also these other settings that are um, very studied, uh, especially recently, but again, I'm new to the literature, so I apologize if, if I don't cite uh, everyone. So it was found, for instance, that SGD, um, okay, sorry, let me explain this for, first. So in, in these two pictures, the blue weights are like frozen, okay? So they are not learned or learnable. And um, in here, we have a scaling regime, which is more similar to the, to the mean field one. And in fact, it is connected to that. And here instead you have linear width uh, input and, and hidden layer, but still the, the, the hidden weights here uh, are blue, so they are frozen. We, don't, we do not learn them. And this is a typical setting of, that occurs in, like in, in neuron tangent kernel on one side, um, where the learning problem turns out to be, let's say, a, a regression in, in, in a high dimensional feature space, or also, it was, uh, yeah, neural tangent kernel was also explained using, again, this mean field, this uh, SGD dynamics uh, uh, in mean field regime at initial stage of learning, at the very beginning, uh, again by May Montanari uh, and other collaborators. Um, then we have also random feature models and, and Gaussian processes neural networks uh, that, that uh, fall into this category. So here, by a simple parameter, parameter counting, we, we understand that it is different from, fundamentally different from our setting because in here, uh, only P parameters, which are the readout weights, are learned, and not uh, DP plus P, which would be in our case. So we have much more stuff to learn. Okay, so more recently, uh, and by more recently, I mean from 2021 to 2023, uh, there has been a serious a line of works uh, going on in which, in which address the full training of the network where all the, the, the weights are learned and they are treated as annealed variables from a statistical mechanics point of view in the free entropy, which means they are integrated inside the partition function. <coughs> um, okay. So these works, uh, also for deeper networks, they address a scaling regime, which is the fully proportional one meaning that n, p, and d go together to infinity with the same rate. And uh, this was, uh, as far as I know, first addressed uh, by Lee and Sompolinsky, uh, whose analysis um, is constrained to, to, to linear networks, so they don't have the nonlinearities, um, even though they argue that uh, some possible extensions that were also um, looked upon by uh, Ariosto, Pacelli, Pastore, Ginelli, Gerardi, Rotondo, uh, that conjecture, formula, conjecture a formula for the empirical risk minimization generalization error um, using um, this statistical mechanics formalism I also displayed before briefly. And then in 2023, we have this paper from Kui, Krizakala, and, and, and Zdebrova uh, that leveraging some Gaussian equivalence principle were able to, let's say, get the computation through and, and, and get this base optimal limits exactly as we do. But we have, let's say, uh, a small problem from uh, the rigorous side, let's say, uh, because our limiting, uh, our scaling, our lim tilde does not catch this scaling regime here. So n, uh, n, p, and d 
cannot, be, cannot go to infinity together according to uh, our limb tilde. And the reason is, let me show this to you again. All right, maybe here. And the reason is precisely this n over p here. So if n uh, and d go together, this is one basically of order one. It's staying, it's, um, <coughs> staying around, a con it's a constant. And this n over p here would be another constant. So this would no longer go to zero in our scaling regime. So we cannot reach uh, the same scaling regime as they do. All right. So um, I, we are not sure if, this is, uh, if there is something fundamental going on, of, of if this is a, um, uh, a wall, let's say, uh, an obstacle uh, that we meet in our proof, we, we, in our proof. We still cannot say that even if Maybe, okay, I'm trying to convince you that there is something fundamental going on, but uh, I'm not 100% sure myself. <clears throat> okay. So, now I uh, will sketch uh, a little bit of the proof, which will also take into account. Yeah, please. I can't hear you, sorry. Uh, D? So here you proved that uh, doing uh, two-layer nets in, uh, in, this in this specific regime that you look at uh, gives you the same test error as uh, teacher-student GLM. Yes. So I'm wondering whether all these papers that look at a slightly different regime observe the same phenomenology. The last one, yes. The last one, yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. In fact, this work was par partially motivated by this observation. And we tried to prove it, but we, we were not able to catch the scaling. <clears throat> and we are trying, currently also trying to understand if there is uh, something going on. There is another question? Do you expect the uh, equivalence to hold, uh, or do you think actually the n over p go to zero is quite important? Uh, when n over p <laughs> is constant, then you don't think it's, uh, there's equivalence. Okay, if you want a personal opinion, uh, but this is personal, it's not math. <laughs> um, I think this can be fundamental because we're looking at the base optimal setting and neglecting n over p um, would mean neglecting some correlations that I'm displaying later. Uh, it is, okay, when you have something, it is always easier to prove it goes to zero rather than it, it goes to two. I don't know, okay? So, yeah, I think there is something going on, but. Um, is there numerical work being done to verify this kind of formula using uh, Langevin dynamics to. Sorry, I did not uh, uh, get the first part. I wonder if there's been numerical work being done to verify this kind of conjecture using Langevin dynamics to sample from the posterior distribution. Not sure about Langevin yeah. dynamics. I mean, just uh, any okay. of the dynamics, just to because it is, it's it's not easy to compute this Bayesian optimal solution. So, yeah, it's true. Um, well, for the GLM, there is the uh, GAMP that can that can uh, yield the, the the base optimal estimator. This is a good point. We don't have an equivalent here yet. It is true. It, it, it's very hard to to sample from it. The Langevin would be very painful. Okay. Hmm. Uh, it could also be that we were not able to push the, the proof uh, further. Huh? This, uh, we have to be careful about that. Okay. So if you are in, how much time do I have, Seth? Um, maybe five more minutes. Five, four, ooh, this is a challenge. Okay. <laughs> so uh, how familiar are you with the Nishimori identities? Yay, Yay okay. Uh, maybe I skip those, okay. It's, um, I can skip directly to this one uh, because Professor Oper asked. So. Uh, okay, the most annoying part of the computation is uh, getting rid of nonlinearities in the middle layer, basically. Um, 
Otherwise, if everything is linear from the point of view at least of, um, let's say, um, fundamental limits, uh, we, can, we can work a way around. But um, so the, the goal, what we would like to try and what inspired our proof are these Gaussian equivalence principles that should hold uh, due to uh, the high dimensional nature of the problem, let's say. And uh, let's say informally, it amounts to replace this phi by this, combi this combination, removing the nonlinearity and uh, tuning this rho and epsilon appropriately. And if you think about it, so the xi here is an additional independent Gaussian noise. But if you think about it, it, it makes sense that here you have rho, which is the average of the, um, the, the expected average of phi prime because uh, the derivative measure the measures the response uh, to, the, to the variations in its arguments. And the rest is, is basically a remainder that uh, can be proved in some circumstances to, get, to be a Gaussian and independent. So the problem is that in, in our setting it is not clear, well, in our setting it is clear, but it was not clear before uh, to what extent this was, uh, this was applicable. All right, uh, so. Also here, I go pretty fast. Uh, the, the strategy is, as usually uh, done in statistical mechanics uh, of disorder systems in the last 20 years, um, and also inference, um, is interpolation. So um, we build um, this set of, well, basically this is, uh, again, a combination of the weights of the teachers, okay, of the two teachers, of both the GLM and and, uh, and the two layer, which is the original model. And you see that for t equal to one, you have the GLM. You have only this last piece here. And for t equal to zero, you recover the initial model that you're actually interested in. And uh, from this, uh, we also build the, the, the student version of the same interpolation, okay? So without the start variables. And we also build an interpolating data set. We need to change also the data set. So why t mu this time is generated by a P out that depends on, on the teacher weights that are built in this interpolating way. <clears throat> okay. Um, so yeah, as a consequence, we also have this interpolating free entropy. Again, for t equal to zero, we have the free entropy of the GLM that we know to compute thanks to, to in, in the teacher student setup, thanks to uh, Jean et al and, and also previous works uh, on the physics side. And then for t equal to one, you have your model, uh, sorry, for t equal to zero, you have your model which you're actually interested in. Okay, so to control the difference between these two, you do, I mean, the simplest thing you can do is to compute the derivative and hope for a uniform control in time uh, with the same order as in the statement uh, of the theorem, okay? And uh, here, I'm very sorry, um, I'm very, where is Dasha? Sorry, Dasha, if I compressed uh, this thing into only one slide because uh, it is actually a very uh, key uh, theorem. So we need, in order to carry out the proof, also the concentration uh, of the free entropy, which is stated uh, in, the, in this form. And um, all right, so let me go faster here. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry for this. Uh, I just wanted to, to flash a couple of things here to understand why we have this bottleneck of the n over p, okay? So if we compute the, the derivative, we have the difference between these terms. Um, using the Nishimori identities uh, that I skipped, <laughs> the last term b can be proven to be zero immediately, and this is, uh, uh, this is fast. So what we expect is that minus a1 counters the A2 and A3 and they cancel each other in this uh, specific regime that, uh, that we have. So inspired by what physicists uh, like Lee and Sompolinsky, but also Rotondo et al. did uh, in their paper, um, we tried at first to integrate directly uh, the, the, the weights of the networks, okay? Which uh, in this rig more rigorous settings amount, uh, amounts to perform an integration by parts with respect to these Gaussian variables. And, uh, but there is a problem because these this Gaussian weights here are in sub phi, so we cannot use Gaussian integration by parts right away. So we focus a little bit on this guy here, and we employ the oldest trick in mathematics, I guess. So 
you subtract what you like, what you would like to have there, and then you add it back, and you control the difference between these uh, red and blue guys. And then here, you, in, in this first line here, that you would like to go to zero, because this is linear and you can treat and it magically cancels the other two contributions, A2 and A3. So you integrate by parts the A star here in the first line, and what you get is this uh, more or less ugly guy, um, okay? All right, so here the first part goes roughly to zero as, as the order that you see in the round parentheses thanks to the concentration of the free entropy. This, this you can show. Then you have this uh, sum of n squared terms of these differences here. U mu nu is a quantity that you can prove to be of order one. It's fine. But the problem is this difference here. So it's n squared variables and um, the only thing that makes you lucky is that this guy in the square brackets concentrates around zero, okay? So it is helping to, to go to zero, but unfortunately, I mean, if you study the order of this, uh, of this guy, you find this uh, little, uh, this small O here of n times square root, and this n over p, which then has to be simplified with the one over n here, th that gives, yields exactly n over p that, uh, it's our bottleneck, it's actually there. And the reason why I personally think uh, that this is a, uh, there is something going on here, it might be fundamental, is that up to this slide, everything I've shown you is exact. I have taken no limit, yes. Yeah. Entry-wise control it or you, you control it as a, the norm of the di uh, uh, norm of the matrix of the difference. Norm of the matrix. So you have red minus blue mu and nu, and uh, yes. do you control it for fixed mu and nu? The end, the size of red minus blue is small. Uh, no, I take mu and nu. I, I, I need to matrix, take them together. Uh, to take look them at the together. norm of the matrix. For example, the operator norm of the matrix that is red minus blue. I think we can. Sorry, sorry, can you say that again? Hey, red minus blue uh, is small, but then there is issue of uh, N over P. Yes. Uh, do you look at the difference of red minus blue entry-wise, or do you look at the difference of red minus blue as a matrix, and then the operator norm of that matrix might be small? No, we don't look at the operator norm, but the okay. fact is that, okay, here I've compressed a lot. There is uh, some subtle T's here because this red minus blue part is not independent of the first part that is here. And also this expectation, there, are, there is some stuff going around there. And if, if the first part were not there, I could prove the concentration how I would like it to be, uh, getting rid of this N over P. And actually I, also can, I can also estimate further orders the problem is that the further orders are correlated with the first part and I cannot get rid of these correlations. And that's, that's my bottleneck. That's why, why we cannot improve that. And typically in empirical risk minimization you don't have this part because you're interested in the infimum of, of the Hamiltonian, so you don't have this expectation log z in the, in the first part. That's why I didn't manage to, to replicate your results, for instance. And that's it. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm All sorry. good. <laughs> sorry, everybody. Take your time to conclude. Ah, well, uh, yeah, okay. So, what about the n over p of order one? Um, this is a question. This is an open question. I would like to discuss with, with people uh, if they have an idea how to improve this because it might be um, okay. It might be either fundamental or very technically hard. So we're we're still not sure about that. A uh, hundred percent, at least. Um, so this is another idea of, of a project I'd like to uh, to pursue, which is uh, what happens if I have a partial information on the W star. So I uh, introduce this additional channel here, and when sigma, which is the signal to noise ratio, in this channel goes to infinity, I know the weights exactly, and I uh, I get back to the random feature model. For instance, when sigma is zero, I know nothing, and this is what I've studied so far. So this could interpolate between the two and maybe 
maybe some interesting phenomena arise from that. Um, then, why not more than two layers? This is also another <laughs> uh, rightful question. Um, the fact is that uh, at the moment we only miss uh, the concentration of the free, free entropy, which needs some combinatorial tricky argument that we hope to be able to import from, from other papers by uh, Hongbing Chen and Jiaming Xia uh, that did that for the multi-layer GLM in which the, the inference problem is different uh, from our learning problem, but maybe uh, we can import uh, some of their machinery. And uh, instead, the, the, the other part of the simplification of these terms I've shown you can be, uh, uh, can be carried on to, to a multi-layer setting if one integrates carefully the weights of the network one by one with an inductive argument. At least I'm confident. Uh, I, I've already started sketching something. And uh, yeah, last question is what happens if we add structure to the data? So this is the, the simplest thing. You can imagine X to be still Gaussian or um, drawn from Gaussian mixtures. Why not? Or other more, more structured types of data. Um, yeah, I thank you for the patience also, I have to say. All right, thank you very much. You already man managed quite a few questions, but I think we have time for maybe a few more before we go to lunch. Matteo. So thanks for the nice talk. And um, so I'd like to get some intuition for this uh, result. So, um, so this generalization error, the mutual information, uh, I mean, is this an upper bound? I mean, because what happens, uh, uh, if I understand right, uh, uh, in this limit when P goes to infinity, that your model should become more expressive. So essentially the mutual information should go up. Yes. But at the same time, uh, your data becomes more structureless in the sense that, uh, uh, yeah, so, and so, I mean, if I if I take, can you take this as an upper bound of, or a lower bound of what you would get uh, with finite p? This is an excellent question. Um, okay, I don't know. The the correct answer is that I don't know. Um, Okay, so if I increase P, I would need more data to, to have more information about all those weights, right? I don't know, I have to think about it, honestly. Um, no, I don't, I, ca I can't say just. of a very simple model. Yes, but I have to correct the very simple model. I mean, there is a, the, okay, let's say that the properties of the more complicated model is, um, are, let's say, collapse into these coefficients rho and epsilon that I, that I carry on. That said, uh, I'm not sure there is a monotonicity between the two. I, I can't say here right now on the spot. I mean, because I'm not very familiar with what happens in commuting machines, that is for finite p. I should, uh, I should first have a look at that, for sure. Sorry. OK, we have time for maybe one last question. But I think. But wait, then it's maybe more of a comment than a question, I guess. But uh. I didn't think so much about it, but your question made makes a lot of sense, but it's not clear that when P gets small, let's say P is two, you should have equivalence because when P is two, right. you have this committee machine which is of a very different nature of a linear model, which is the perceptron. So I don't think you, no, no, but I don't expect this kind of results to hold for P small. I don't expect this 
this kind of two layer knot network to recover a committee machine with more than with at least two hidden units because because you can suddenly model nonlinear rules which are much more complex than the linear GLM so I, I don't think it's the same thing at all yes but, yeah it's very yeah yes yes but we should come Yes, but we should comment on this. You are you're right. All right, that was a very interesting session. Let's thank Francesco again for his talk. Yeah.